Hi, this is Delilah S. Dawson, author of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, Black Spire, and Phasma, and you're listening to the Living Force Podcast. Welcome to the Living Force Podcast. Be mindful of the Living Force, young Padawan. A Utini production. They were no wonder. Episode 20, A Crash of Fate Roundtable. Shh. Grown-ups are talking. In this episode, the Utini team talks about the latest Star Wars Galaxy Edge novel, A Crash of Fate, plus an update on the Utini bookshelf, and exploring the mystery of Mar. Some moof milker put a compressor on the ignition line. And now, here are your hosts. I have been expecting you. Dr. Corey Helton, Eric Eilerson, and Dr. Charles Hankel. Utini! Uh, yeah, I... The thing is, I'm not... I can lift things? But at a certain with your point, mind? yeah, yeah. With, no, the mind is what leaves. I feel like when you're moving, like the body can keep going, but eventually your mind just starts to give up hope and starts to realize this is all you're gonna do for the rest of your life, and it starts to kind of like we- needle its way into your brain and say you're never gonna have a home, you're never gonna belong. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? <laughs> I'm talking about what moving is done with my brain, dude. <laughs> I'm starting <laughs> to see some of the effects. Tell that to Club. Oh, well, let's hope our audience does not on this week's episode of The Living Force, episode 20. Welcome, 20? everybody. Holy 20. smokes. We're 20. 20 episodes in. That's nuts. We've been doing this for 20 weeks. That's we are crazy to it's me. It's almost half a year of weekly episodes. Doesn't feel right? like that. No. No, but welcome. If you've been with us since the beginning, um, thank you, because that's super cool that you guys have made us feel like we can kind of add something to your week. By just chatting about the Star Wars and Corey Charles, man, we put up with each other for at least an hour a week for 20 weeks. Just barely. <laughs> just barely holding on. <laughs> uh, but to fully introduce you guys to our new mm. listeners, potentially, my name is Eric Eilerson. I'm one of your co-hosts. And with me, as I said, are the doctors themselves. Dr. Corey Helton, hello. Hello, hello. And Dr. Charles Hankel. What's up, dude? Hey there. All right. And we are the Living Force podcast today we are going to give you one of our slowly becoming famous roundtable episodes on galaxy's edge a crash of fate but before that happens we have a little bit of news to get into and in fun news guys i wanted to start us off with something not related to ut or the living force at all which is maybe the biggest thing that has happened to star wars fandom in the last couple months which is mar now (laughs) If you're listening and you don't know what Mar is, we're recording this on, for, for, for full transparency, Monday, September 2nd. So this past weekend, a woman named Mar, who was on Twitter as at Vibes with Cisco, which is pretty great, has taken it upon herself to watch the entirety, well, almost the entirety at this point, of the Star Wars saga and live tweet. And it has been some of the most entertaining, incredible live tweets because, dudes, she had never seen these movies before. She didn't know who any of the characters were. She didn't know any she's, of the plot points. She still doesn't really know who the characters are. She still doesn't know who they are. Like, <laughs> the names that she gives them are, like, my favorite thing. It's been incredible because it's been this, like, unifying force in Star Wars fandom of a lot of us in, in the community seeing this person who's like a unicorn, right? They shouldn't exist. They're, they're, yeah. they're lovely and unique. They haven't seen Star Wars before. They don't know any spoilers, and they're old enough to be able to tweet and like have coherent <laughs> thoughts. Which is crazy to even consider in this day and age. I mean, I mean, you know, inside Glenn, she probably knows who people are, like Luke Skywalker. She knows the name. Darth Vader, Yoda. She probably knows some of those people, at least. Uh, Breathe Taker and old-ass yeah. Wrigley Raisin Man, <laughs> to be, to be uh, <laughs> specific. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's just, I, yeah, I want to address Mar real quick because she has been making our lives with this stuff this weekend. And if you haven't seen her tweets, even if you don't have a Twitter account, head on over to Twitter at vibes with Cisco and her pinned tweet. She has links to all her threads. It's beautifully well organized movie by movie. And, uh, at this point she's done episodes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and rogue one. So solo yeah. and last Jedi are on the table. And, I mean, people are talking about trying to get her to celebration. Um, She has just been kind of inundated with this community. And it's been really really cool because, I mean, there's been some negative voices that naysayed her a bit and blah, blah, blah. They're stupid because the vast majority of – Yeah. 
because the vast majority of us have just been so excited to see this new person kind of jump into this community and like the the official the disturbance Star Wars disturbance in the force man when somebody yes. come, when somebody new comes in that's like what yeah. we're all about man but isn't yeah. that isn't that what we all want like don't we just want people to share this with like that's the yes. entire yes. point Absolutely. of this podcast that's the entire is. that's the point of fandom like if you're hating yeah. on her for enjoying the films that you yourself yeah. love that just doesn't even make any sense i, I got to say it was pretty it was pretty cool too to get like there were some folks on Twitter that like tagged us too, or like, Hey, get her into the books. And that yeah. was, like, we've been DMing a little bit this week about possibly, uh, possibly making that happen. So Mar, if you're out there, we would like you to be an official sponsor. Well, mm-hmm. Utini would like to be the official sponsor of the Mar. Of, of the, the Mar, Mar reading Wars. journey. The Mar, <laughs> the Mar reading Wars. journey. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So just Mar, we love you. We love what you've been doing. And, for everyone else that has been tweeting at her and showing her love, way to represent this community. That's been super, super cool. All right, now to get more selfish about it, because after all, this podcast is about us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't kid over... yourself, Eric. It's only about you. That's right. <laughs> you know why I started the show. Um, over on utini.com, we got a few reviews this week, everybody. We got a lot of reviews this week. We have, we got so many reviews this week that we can't even read them all on the show, and that's never happened before, so... I feel like that's a milestone to get it's enough that mi- en- enough in one week that like mm-hmm. we don't even have enough time to talk about it. That's impressive. Yeah, and specifically those reviews have been reviews on individual books. So if you haven't been to utini.com, every book in the Star Wars universe has its own book profile with all the info about it, with some of our thoughts about it. And you as a listener or as a community member can go and review the book on a five-star scale and leave a little blurb. And this week we got tons of reviews by some of our Best friends, Young Animus left a bunch. Dylan Sasser left six reviews on a bunch of various books, including uh, Dark Disciple, Thrawn Trees, and a couple others. So just a huge shout-out to that love. Um, and we're going to try to read more of them some weeks where we don't have to get through an entire book in one roundtable sitting. <laughs> but we just wanted to shout-out to you guys and say we saw your reviews. Thank you so much. And if you're listening and you're reading a Star Wars book now or you got that favorite book you just want to let people know about, head over to utini.com. Add your review to those of Young Animus and Dylan and everyone else, and we'll read them on the show as we can. Now, finally, a couple more things. We got iTunes reviews, which we also love. This is a big review part of our show. We got a bunch of new iTunes reviews over on The Living Forest, which we super appreciate because, again, the whole algorithm of iTunes and Apple and all that jazz, it does weirdly help. It helps people see us if they search for Star Wars podcasts and things like that. And I did want to read just one, if I may, guys. Which is yeah. by uh, user Irma Jedi twenty six, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> Excellent choice. And they said the following: This is the perfect podcast for any Star Wars fan, especially those that enjoy the EU. The hosts are insightful, funny, and positive. The episodes are the perfect length for my commute. My favorite part of the show is the book review episodes. Welcome to another one. It makes me feel like I'm part of a book club. Keep up the great work, guys. May the force be with you. So thank you. Thank you to Irma Jedi 26 That's literally what we're trying to do. Is everything you said in your review. So I guess that's lunch. Good job, everyone. Yep, that's <laughs> it. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks a lot, man. It's really great to get feedback like this because, mm-hmm. like, that's why we're doing this in the first place. And I don't know. It makes you feel good. I, I, it's just it's cool that strangers yeah. on the Internet have found us and like what we have to say. When, you know, I don't really think we have that much to say, but I guess someone does. Yeah, which is cool. We all love validation. Why not? <laughs> all right. Last things before we get into this roundtable. It's a more expedited intro because we got a lot to talk about about this book. Corey, can you tell us a little bit about something that we're going to be launching at the end of September? Guys, the Utini bookshelf is finally ready for launch. Thunderous applause! Yeah, seriously. So we've been promising that the Utini bookshelf is coming out next month for like eight months. <laughs> and we're finally here. We're finally here, and I'm super excited. You guys have played with it. It's really mm-hmm. fun. It's really expansive. There's lots of different lists now. Expect to see some emails coming your way uh, about the bookshelf. If you're not already on our on our mailing list, then you got to head over to utini.com and sign up. At the very bottom of the page, there's a place to sign up. But, um, yeah, 
the bookshelf is coming very, very soon. Yeah. We're officially launching the bookshelf on September 20th. Will it be the day that it totally goes live? So you heard it here first. If you want in, go to utini.com. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. You're, you're going to be able to finally have all your books you've read in one place, all your books you've owned but haven't read in one place, the books you want to read next in one place, all these things in one digital format yep. that is beautifully designed for you to keep track of your reading orders so you can read along with us. Yeah, if and if you haven't heard of this already, the Utini Bookshelf is essentially like an online tracking program to keep track of what Star Wars books you own, what you've already read, what you haven't read, what you want on your wish list. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we, we had an old version of this on our site you know, like a year ago, and we needed a major update, which we've been working on for like six months now. And uh, I'm really pleased, and I hope everybody likes it as much as I do. So yeah, get, get ready, September 20th. September 20th, log on. And a large part of why we've been able to do work like that is thanks to a couple people that support us over on Patreon. And we did get a new patron since our last recording intro. I think it was before last episode, but because of our Delilah Dawson interview, which, guys, by the way, I wasn't on that episode. That was great. Oh, yeah. Well I, done. I, I, was, I, I, I never really awesome. got your feedback on that. Like, Yeah, I loved that. She is dope as hell. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, she was a lot of fun. And for full transparency, that interview happened because of Eric. So it did. It's very it did. sad that he was not able to be there. But Eric does all the work on the show. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Always happy to set stuff up, and I'm sure it won't be the last time we have her on. But yeah, super solid work on that, guys. And if you haven't heard that interview, one episode back on the feed, Delilah Dawson interview talks about Black Spire, talks about Phasma, all kinds of cool stuff. But because we didn't do new intros for those episodes we wanted to say thank you to adrian carlson who's our newest patron thank you welcome to the family and we are still working on creating our tiers and rewards for patreon we have basically a rough draft of what we think it's gonna be look at that keep your eyes on our pages in the next coming months and we will be launching that with full new episodes of stuff some little fun swag perks so keep an eye out on patreon and Especially for those of you that joined early, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and your uh, your well earned dollars will come to fruition. I promise. <sighs> okay, I think that may be the fastest intro we've ever done. So we're gonna take a super early quick break, and then we are gonna dive right into Galaxy's Edge: A Crash of Fate. See you in a bit. Hi, my name is Frank, and I'm part of the Utini database team. I'm going to go old school back to 1992 when I was just 20. I was looking for a book to read at my local bookstore when a book caught my eye with the word Star Wars on the front. First thing that struck me was the cover art. It reminded me of the classic film posters from episode 4, 5 and 6. It had the heroes on the front, Han, Luke, Leia and Chewbacca, a group of stormtroopers in battle, an Imperial commander dressed in white and the background a menacing Jedi type figure which looked like lasers shooting out of his fingers. I flipped the book over and began to read the intro five years after the, the destruction of the Death Star. And my first reaction was to put that book back on the shelf. I can't mess with the classics, I thought, and I walked away. I continued looking for a book at the bookstore that day, but I kept finding myself being drawn back to that very spot by the bookshelf that contained this mysterious Star Wars book that I wanted to know more about. I eventually gave in to my curiosity and purchased the book, and I loved it. I was hooked, and I wanted more. The book was, of course, Heir to the Empire by Timothy Zahn. And unknown to myself at that time, I had just taken my very first ever step into the Star Wars expanded universe that means so much to me to this day. If you'd like to find out about all of Tim D. Zahn's Star Wars books, check out his book collection on utini.com. Just click on the Reader's Guide on the menu and scroll down to Discovery Books by Author and you'll find it there. That's it. Bye for now. And remember, may the Force be with you always. And we're back. And I'm... <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that 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 clip took it out of me. This again? This we, beauty. We're back to this again. Eric, just, is that, is that I, a single tear that I see it, rolling down your is. cheek? And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm just going to let it go. <laughs> and now it's gone. Good clip. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you have listened to these roundtable episodes before, you know that at this time, I usually throw it over to Dr. Charles Hankel to run these. We're going renegade. We are crashing in the force of Batu. And I am taking over this roundtable. So we're going to see how this goes. And if this is a total travesty, Charles, we will know you have truly the golden touch for roundtables. <laughs> Job security. Think, yes, that's right. <laughs> also, this is 100% full of gigantic spoilers. So if you, haven't, mm-hmm, mm. if you haven't hit the spoiler alarm yet, Matt, then do that right now. Spoiler alert. 
Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Uh, everything's under control. Situation normal. All right. So without further ado, here is our official Living Force podcast roundtable on Galaxy's Edge Crash of Fate by Zoraida Cordova. So first thing I'm going to do, guys, I'm just going to read a quick summary of the book. Then we'll do our ratings, and then we'll dive into some questions. So, A Crash of Fate by Zoraida Cordova tells the story of Izzy and Jules, two childhood friends who were ripped out of each other's lives far too early, and the wild adventures that reunite them on their one-time homeworld of Batu. Izzy finds herself in possession of a package that needs to be delivered to the mysterious Doc Ondar, and when that package goes missing, the seemingly star-crossed pair must enlist the help of local gangster Ogagara, as well as a host of new faces that populate Black Spire Outpost. Throw in the re-emergence of Izzy's old gang, which includes her ex-boyfriend no less, and you have a fast-paced heist adventure effortlessly interwoven with a beautiful love story. <sighs> Sounds nice. So It does. Classic it, YA, too. Classic YA. Yeah. So, go around. You know how we do this. 1 to 10. Don't tell me why. And then we'll see if it changes by the end of this. Corey, 1 to 10 on Crash of Fate. I'm going 7.5. 7.5 by Dr. Corey Helton. Solid. Very solid. And uh, Charles. <clears throat> I might shock you guys here. I'm going to give it a 6. Okay, All right. That is a low ball from Dr. Hankel. It Charles is. gives it a 6. All right. Um, yeah. I am going to stay pretty beautifully on brand and give it an 8.5 from me um i really <laughs> not surprised <laughs> oh my god i just love the fact that we never discuss this before we come into these recordings and one of us always absolutely adores the book and gives it like some outrageously high number and somebody else is like this book is trash it's awful i'm giving it a five man this is pretty close to i think what our our long lost queen shadow podcast was like yeah. <laughs> which again we now we can never discuss again because we want this recording to go well. We talk about Queen Shadow on more episodes than any other book, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's true. Yes, we have. All right. So interesting. So Corey, 7.5. Charles, 6. I have an 8.5. We'll go through some questions we came up. And by the end of it, we'll see if any of us can sway the other ones. We'll find out. Because, again, our whole purpose at The Living Force, we want to love every single book. We want to love this world. We want to love these characters. Sometimes it just takes us. And we, uh, we need a little push. So we'll see if that happens. So first of all, guys, I'm going to steal from what Charles did in Thrawn Treason, because I thought that went pretty well. As opposed to going point by point by point by point, we're going to talk about characters for a bit, and then we're going to talk about some overarching questions. Sound cool? Yes. All right. So first of all, this novel is literally divided chapter by chapter into Izzy and Jules chapters, right? So if you ever read Game of Thrones, very similar. You have like a Tyrion chapter, Daenerys chapter, stuff like that. You get Izzy does a chapter from her point of view, and then Jules does. Uh, Did you guys like... That she did that, and why or why not? Yes. I think it was a good thing for this book, just because so many of the situations that the two characters were in, they had they saw the same thing from a slightly different angle and had a totally different interpretation of the event, and I thought that added a lot of, I don't know, like stress to the story. Um, mm-hmm. It added a lot of drama to it, and I think that they kind of needed that device. Yeah, I will echo that. I really enjoy uh, Star Wars books when they are sort of chapter by chapter, like bouncing around from characters like that. A lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of the older legend stuff is like kind of that I fell in love with. It's why it got me into the EU in the first place. Is written like that. Like, um, like a lot of big series books are written like that. Like, um, isn't the X Wing series kind of chapter by chapter characters? Not like straight up hardcore switching back and forth. Yeah. Maybe I'm, it, maybe I'm no, wrong. No, it is. It is. Yeah. It, it doesn't say like the character's name at the beginning, but you'll get a whole chapter from Wedge, then a whole chapter yeah. from Corrin. And, yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of Legends books that do that. And like I fell in love with Star Wars because of the Legacy series book. And you get like a Luke chapter and this mm-hmm. other character chapters. And I, I've always really enjoyed that. And like that's that's been a little bit missing, I think, from, from the canon stuff a little bit. So mm-hmm. I really enjoyed the predictable back and forth nature of, of Izzy and Jules. And, and I hadn't really thought about it until you just mentioned it, Charles, but getting to see like the exact same scene from different perspectives, or at least like the it was done well. Like the tail end of yeah. one scene like would be in the beginning of another chapter. So yeah. like it wasn't like just repeating everything over and over again. It was like with small overlapping, and I thought it was done really well. Yeah, I agree, because I think we, we have seen some of the, like, you know, multiple storylines. So, in, uh, you know, in something like Alphabet Squadron at the beginning of the book, we got when Chiss and Will were with the other squadron before they met Erica and stuff. But this one was literally, like you guys were saying, the same scene sometimes. And I thought that was really 
a, honestly a brave choice because it could have gotten monotonous. Yeah. And I applaud uh, Cordova for not falling into that trap. Um, but other than what we like about it, do you think there's any specific reason that she chose to do it that way? Because, like you said, it's it's pretty unique as far as it's gone out to literally title the chapters like that. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, as far as why she does it, maybe we'll get her on the show and ask her. But, I mean, I, I don't know. I know a lot of young adult books have sort of a predictable format a little bit, mm-hmm. so maybe she has a lot of experience. I actually don't know that much about her as an author, so maybe she has some experience mm-hmm. doing that, so I don't know. I well, think that just ultimately it's that – you have to read a story about two people essentially falling in love with each other. And Mm -hmm. to do that, to just bounce back and forth within the same chapter would be pretty jarring, I think. So to break it up character by character, chapter by chapter, I think it just works really well that way. That's a great point. And and I like that she gives them both an equal amount of agency in the book. It's not like one of them is always speaking for the feelings of the other. Because next chapter you'll find out what they're feeling about it. So that was cool. That's a great point that we got to watch them fall in love with each other. Not one of them fall in love with the other. And then they just happen to like them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So now we'll get a little more specific on those characters. Uh, Isil Garcia, Izzy is our first person I want to talk about. I want to ask you guys how you would describe her after I read this single quote. It was on page 52. If you're following along in your hymnals, she says, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> As the years went by, she figured out that it was easier to leave a place when there was no one there who might miss you. And to me, that quote kind of summarized a lot of early Izzy in the book. You know, she comes in as the – she's coming back home, home, quote unquote. She lived here for a bit, hopping around planet to planet, doesn't really have any ties, doesn't really have any close community. She wants to get out, do a job, and leave, which is very Star Wars. It's very Han. It's very, you know, all smugglers that we've met. Yes. Um, do you think that that kind of got cemented right at the beginning of the book for you? Yeah, I I totally do. Honestly, that's my favorite storytelling device in all of Star Wars is mm-hmm. some kid on some garbage trash planet that wants to escape <laughs> and like do a bunch of other cool stuff. That's like like guys, that's like my childhood. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm from yeah, yeah flipping such as boondocks georgia okay like the middle of freaking nowhere and i was like constantly dreaming about being somewhere else <laughs> so i just i love it i mean i love that i love that I mean, that's the story of luke on tatooine that's the story that we got of the main characters in lost stars which is mm-hmm. as we've talked about over and over on this show one of our most favorite books in all of yeah. star wars and i love it it works it's a it's a great formula and it works really well and I really enjoyed it. It, it went, as soon as I realized that was sort of happening, like after the, the first couple chapters, I was I was pretty into the story. Charles, what do you think about Izzy? I was not a very big fan of Izzy. And mm-hmm. it had nothing to do with the fact that she kind of bounced around and was kind of a smuggler type of character because I love those kind of characters. I mean, I love mm-hmm. Han Solo. He's one of my favorites. But what I've had with Izzy that really frustrated me is I felt like she constantly defined herself by the people that were around her. Like, Mm -hmm. I never felt like she found a self-identity very much. Like, when we first meet her, she, you know, identifies with the crew that she runs with, with Anatola's crew and Mm -hmm. with Dammer. And then one day later, you know, goes to Batu and then starts defining herself. And this is just how I interpret it, with Mm -hmm. her new relationship with Jules. But I never felt like she really established... Mm -hmm her own identity that well and anything that she personally stood for outside of relationships that she had with others. Well, yeah. I, th- I, th- I agree with that. I think that's kind of yeah. the point. I think that's kind of the point of her character in the first place though. It's like that kind of classic coming of age. I mean, she's only 18 too. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's the thing. I think I'm actually, Charles going to agree with what you're saying. Um, and for me, I think it was just, that was weirdly what, what intrigued me to her was, was that she's not solid and that she's not finding herself yet. And, I mean, yes, so I don't think we mentioned that yet on this podcast. If for some reason you haven't read the book, that's totally cool. Welcome. The entire story takes place in one day on Batu, which is kind of a huge, unique thing. Holy crap, you're totally right. I've not even yeah. realized that. A whole, it all takes yeah. place on tw- in 24 hours. Day. Wow. And I think that by the end of it, Izzy definitely finds more elements of who she wants to be, but she's definitely not fully formed yet. I think she has room to grow. So I found that intriguing, personally, but I can absolutely see how that could feel like a protagonist that you're not necessarily quite on board with 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just so. like I agree that in some ways it's similar to Luke and what and whatnot, but like Luke has a cause. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yes, he does yeah. define himself a lot by the relationships that he has with other people, mm-hmm. but he still has his own specific calling and his own specific cause. And I felt like Izzy lacked that. Yeah, and I think, and I think maybe by the end of it, that's what we're kind of seeing her find is that she th- she thought her calling was to join this gang with Anatola and all them. And that clearly wasn't it. So within this day is the first time in her life that she's like, wait, maybe it's something different, which is what I think the epilogue gets to, which we'll get to obviously way, way later. Right. Um, no, another question for you guys. Why do you think that Cordova chose to introduce us to Izzy and Jules, for that matter, as children in the prologue? Because the prologue of the story takes place when they're like five and six and they're mm-hmm. um, they're just climbing some of the spires on Batu. They get attacked by a giant animal. And then that night we are to we know that Izzy's family leaves. So why do you think that we got? Because it's it's mentioned in flashbacks. It could have easily just been done in flashbacks. But why do you think it was important for us to see these characters first as kids? Uh, maybe just to kind of see how connected they were, like initially, and how it seemed like their relationship was really just ripped out from under each other. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I I will say though that. While reading, I did frequently think about the prologue. I don't know about you guys, but mm-hmm. like I, oh, freak- me too. Yeah. I frequently thought about the prologue. And one of the things that really frustrates me a little bit about the timing of everything is like, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know about you guys. When I was 18, I was not looking back on my six-year-old best friend like, wow, I really miss that person. This is the most important person in my life. And that's definitely how it was treated. Like, but yeah, as a, yeah, as for a, sure. A six year old, I mean, that's like first grade, man. Like mm-hmm. kindergarten, first grade. Like, I'm not even, I can vaguely, I'm not even sure if I can remember who my best friend was in, in the first grade. <laughs> like, I can remember who my best friend was in middle school. I'm 26 now, but like first grade, that's like way back. So for an 18 year old to like fondly remember their best friend from being six and like, fall in love with them and been like, wow, how did I not know this person all this time? Is is a little jarring to me, just the age mm-hmm. range. And I don't know that, that, that bothered me the entire book though. I think that's fair. I think yeah. that's fair to, to answer your question, Eric, I think that it could have been done in flashbacks, but what doing it at the very beginning of the book did was it allowed us to feel some of the pain that the characters were expressing immediately Mm -hmm. upon meeting them and kind of understanding where some of that was coming from as opposed to having to learn about that later it gave you a little bit of an an emotional investment i think especially izzy getting taken away uh, by her parents it it gave you that upfront emotional impact that you needed to kind of start the ride through the rest of the book yeah no i I totally agree and i think that this what it did for me was it exemplified the idea of show don't tell which i think i've said on here at some point where I would much rather be shown why something is important than to have someone tell me why it's important. And I think that that short prologue, as brief as it was and as you know, as young as they were, the second they met each other again, us as readers already knew how close they were, already know yeah. already knew kind of how dire the circumstances were when they were separated. Yeah. So I think that was that was a really smart thing and yeah. something that I'm, I'm I am glad we got to I'm glad time. we got to see that like before. Yeah. Like like as far as it being a flashback or not, I'm glad we got to see like their separation kind of mm-hmm. initially rather than rather than later because that did really set the tone of like you know, Izzy's parents are up to something kind of sketchy and Yep. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Now Izzy obviously evolves out of that kind of horrendous experience of being separated from her friend losing her parents all these things she kind of starts to wall up and for me it kind of came to a peak with this little motto that she said she said it on page 332 she said it a bunch of other times her phrase was lying is a skill right that comes up over and over it's used eventually as a code word for more or less uh later on in the book but why do you think that she kind of holds that sentence so close to her heart? Or why, what does that mean to her? Lying is a skill. I think it comes from her mother is what it's ultimately founded in. Because her mother essentially was some kind of spy, right? Like some kind of operative. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I don't know exactly still Very shady. what she some was. Shady stuff. Yeah. yeah. But she essentially like worked for Oga for a while. Worked for other people, it seems like. Went on these missions of some sort. Mm-hmm. And... 
And really, Izzy never had any idea about that, and yet she learned a lot of her own characteristics from her mother. And so I think it's just kind of coming from that. Now, as far as like what significance does it have, I really don't know. I really never got the significance of that line. Like, I, Corey, I, what about you? I mean, that it yeah, never I mean, really landed for she me. She seems to really be struggling with identity and like... Like, what is she supposed to have gotten from her parents a little bit? And, mm-hmm. like, I mean, she has a very complicated relationship with her mother. And it's, mm-hmm. to me, it seems like one of those things that was, like, maybe her mother said a lot and, like, kind of drilled it into mm-hmm. her head. So she sort of repeats it to herself all the time and has only started to sort of think about what it actually means. Like, like what do all these skills that my mother was obsessed with teaching me that I, I know like the back of my hand are part of me. Like, what is it, what does it actually mean? So I don't know. It's sort of like self-reflection a little bit to me is maybe that's why she says it a lot, but I did notice that it was in there a lot and it seemed to be sort of, sort of like a catchphrase for her, I guess. I mean, it kind of sums up her whole life lying as a skill. Exactly. For me, that's exactly what it was. I think that, because we mentioned earlier, you know, she doesn't know, she doesn't know who she is. She's still finding herself out through this day, through her whole life. And to me, lying is a skill kind of embodies her whole life up to this point where she has been lying to everyone she's met because she's like, I don't know who you need me to be. And I don't know who I am. So I will just pretend to be whatever you want me to be. I will pretend to be the great girlfriend um, for, for this one dude. I'll pretend to be a great gang member for another person, but I'm not any of these things. And I think at the end of the day, she was also lying to herself, was saying that I'm lying to myself every single day, saying I want this life. And it's only when she finally meets Jules that she can say, oh, okay, not only am I not lying to him about how I feel, but I'm also finally not lying to myself. I'm finally honest with myself about I'm happy with this boy for this moment, and I'll figure out the rest in the next moment. And I think that's kind of a... Especially for for a YA novel, right? I think that people reading this book, whether you be, you know, a fifteen year old or a twenty seven year old man, that's moving in Chicago a lot. Like, I think you kind of <laughs> need that now and then to to just say, I'm gonna acknowledge the fact that I'm being honest with myself for just a second. Yeah, and I think that's okay. So that that was, uh, that, that hit me in a very very personal, very specific way. So shout out to Cordova for that. A couple more things about Izzy before we move on to Julin. A lot of times we are introduced to gangs or smugglers in Star Wars, and they're like heroes, right? They're, they're lovely. It's it's Hondo, it's it's Han, it's all these guys that, yeah, they steal and kill people, but they're actually <laughs> good guys. They're right. all actually good guys. And at the beginning of this book, in the birthday scene, we meet Izzy's gang led by Anatola, and they're like kind of bad. They're kind of awful, and. I thought it was interesting because when I was first reading this chapter, I'm like, oh, okay, here's going to be the new crew, and they're going to be a little iffy, but they're not. They're smugglers, so they're definitely nice. But then they just leave her to die in a firefight on her birthday. <laughs> yeah, that was that was weird. So, and then when they come up later in Batu, like they're they never quite have that turn, right? So, what do you guys think about kind of taking back the idea of the smuggler? Frankly, because they've been our heroes for so many decades. Yeah, I mean, I love the – these are my hero villains. Yeah, man! <laughs> I love – this is why the Edge of the Empire RPG version of the Star Wars RPG, because there's, like, different versions, right? You can play as as the Age of, Repo- Age of Rebellion, which is, like, Rebels and Empire stuff. You can play as the Force and Destiny, which is, like, Jedi stuff. Or you can play as Edge of the Empire. And Edge of the Empire is, like, you know, your bounty hunters, your scoundrels. It's, like, by far – by far, by the gaming community, the most popular like yeah. of the Star Wars RPG because there's something really fun about pirates and bounty hunters and kind of scummy characters in a seedy back alley and a cantina, and I loved it. I, I really liked that these were kind of the villains were just these sort of mm-hmm. – like they're not important. Like they're stupid little mission yeah. they're working on. Whatever it is that they're so secretive about, it doesn't actually matter at all in the grand scheme of things. It's just mm-hmm. some credits are on the line, and they're scum. And I like them as villains. I, I thought it was fun to to get some of that. Yeah, I think it's important to have these kind of smugglers. I think it's important to have people that don't have to be Sheev Palpatine to be just evil people, right? Like, yeah, I mean, people suck sometimes. I think that's themselves. important. I mean this. That kind of crew is what I want in The Mandalorian. So I'm yes. happy to see a crew like that in a book as well. 
Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. I'm not going to add anything to that because I think you guys absolutely nailed it. Last thing on Izzy, because at the end of the day, this is a romance book, right? And her feelings about Jules are very obvious from the start. We don't really have this big, drawn-out courtship or whatever. Like, we're inside their heads, and we know exactly <laughs> what all. they're Apparently, thinking. Apparently, you know? it takes place in 24 hours. I'm madly <laughs> right? in love by the end. So. <laughs> yeah, so oh, just, to be 18 again. That's all I got to oh, say. Oh, to be 18. And that's what I want to hit on, man, because on page 80, she says, uh, referring to Jules, his brown eyes so dark that looking into them was like falling into a deep sea. And this book is filled with a lot of quotes like that of kind of just the unbridled passion of young love, right? Of this person is now the most important person I've ever met. And I'm not going to be ashamed about that, at least within my own mind. Because, yeah. again, we are, we are privy as readers to be inside their actual consciousness. So we know how deeply they're feeling this love. How did... How did that sit with you guys about having a character who is so instantaneously this passionate about someone else and kind of having a no holds bar romance aspect? I mean, it felt realistic, kind of what you yeah. were already talking about. I mean, that is that that is how young love tends to start. There's honestly right. a lot of times, not to offend anybody, there there is a, a large element of lust to it i mean yeah and that, that's sure. kind of how this came across and you know not to say that real things can't grow out of that and that maybe izzy and jules do end up being together forever and that could have been <laughs> epilogue part two i don't know yeah but it but it i mean any of us who are older you know like the younger people who read these books enjoy them because they can relate to what they're currently living and anyone who's older that's reading these books we can relate to it because we remember what it was like and it, yeah. i mean that's just realistic totally and it's funny because i mean as you get older too you you hear these couples in their 50s and 60s and stuff the the happy ones that get the the youtube videos and everything are like i still look at her like we're 16 you know that's yeah. that's that's the thing that people always say that they're going for is like i'm i want to feel about my partner the way that I did when she was jumping into my truck after a football game. And we yeah, were, you know, we totally. were, so, and I think that's, that's a really fun element of there's nothing kind of, uh, cynical about it. There is saying we haven't seen each other in 15 years or whatever it is, but man, he is so hot and <laughs> I am not going to pretend he's not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it was, I think it's accurate. Like for sure. It's definitely accurate. Like, I mean, I remember being 18 and it was so easy to fall in love at 18. So yeah, it's just like, it's just like this depiction to answer your question, this depiction of young love, I think it's accurate, but it's like better because they're all carrying guns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the stakes are higher. Yes. Uh, so to use this to segue into Julian Rakab, which is the full name of Jules, just a couple questions about him. Cause a lot of the stuff for Izzy kind of applies to him as well on this whole young love train. Right, I'm going to go to our second question on him. When Izzy comes back, he feels as though he will instantly die for her. All right, the second he sees her again, his whole day has changed, his whole life plan has changed. Bam, right? We don't see him falling slowly. And I feel like as I was reading it, I was thinking that's kind of unique in Star Wars because we we see romance, right? But we usually see like Anakin and Padme, they fall in love as it happens. Yeah. Han and Leia fall in love and they start out, but with Jules especially, it starts out, he is in love. Bam. Yeah. There is no time for the falling because he knows this is the love of his life automatically. Well, you know, speaking from experience, being from, you know, bumfuck nowhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, Izzy sounds like a babe. And, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he's, he's from this backwater planet. It, it, he actually talks about in the book how his... He's got some slim pickings when it comes to, you know, companions and stuff. So, I sure. mean, I mean, I guess I get it. He fell head over heels. It's like the, you know, most attractive galactic stranger he's ever laid eyes on. So, I get it. It's also not a stranger. Like, it's That's got right. the allure of the stranger while still having the comfort of home. Yes, because you remember what it's like to have a six-year-old best friend. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think there's definitely an element to that. And it, it's funny because... You know, as – and I, I'm going to choose the horn on this for my, my anti-toxic masculinity thing here is that we get to see this dude be super open about how much he loves this woman, like, yeah. from the get-go. He's not like, 
oh, I mean, we guys will see what happens. He's like, no, she's the most beautiful sunflower I've ever seen, and I'm going to die for her. And that is it. And I think that's kind of an, a really beautiful thing to write for, you know, again, a Star Wars book that's going to statistically possibly attract more men than women, depending on the demographic. And to have young men read a story about a man who is not afraid to be so in love and so vulnerable from the from the start, yeah, I think in the, in the larger scale, give me a lot of hope for the world. Yeah, I liked yeah, I like Jules. Cool. I think a lot better than I did Izzy. In fact, like Jules yes. is definitely my favorite character out of this. I don't know what you guys think, but mm-hmm. like, yeah, I don't Doc know. Doc Ongar is my favorite. Yeah, Doc Ongar, he was great. Ooh, we'll get to him in a second. Um, but yeah, Jules is just so I don't know, like transparent. I guess. I mean, mm-hmm. I really appreciate that he's just like he is. How do I put this? He's like emotionally vulnerable without being like a whiny baby, which is sometimes yeah. hard to depict in books mm-hmm. in men because like that's a pretty fine line. Like you you can be you can be very emasculine, which is mm-hmm. different than than just being you know connected with your emotional side. Like yeah. you can be unmasculine, which is kind of hard to write sometimes i feel like yeah and, it's a difficult line especially in the kind of cur- current culture of where we're evolving and how people are we're evolving and how we see people and to have a character that is hyper masculine i mean he's a yeah. farm worker like he is very manual he is very strong but he's also very vulnerable and not having yeah. those contradict each other like he's, and he's, never... he's, he seems very genuine with people yes. and his emotions for them and how he cares about his friends and people he likes mm-hmm. and how he cares about his sister and yeah, I liked him a lot. He was a great character. Yeah. Yeah, I think kind of what you guys are getting at is he shows strength without being like the aggressive yeah. type that you yeah. tend to see from like James Bond or, you know, those kind of older right. films. Like, or he, Han. He shows, Han Solo, yeah. He shows, yeah. I mean, he shows an incredible amount of strength for a lot of reasons that you might historically not relate to being strong. Absolutely. Now, what he does, though, throughout this book, he gives a lot of excuses for never leaving Batu. right? Everyone says, Jules, why didn't you leave here? Didn't you say you were going to go a couple seasons ago and everything like that? Do you think there's a possibility he was actually waiting for Izzy to come back all these years? Or, uh, this is a leading question because you're going to know what I think. Has, <laughs> has he accidentally created a life here? Has he, like, kind of stumbled into... Yes. On, yeah, we okay. were aggressively shaking our heads. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, Visual on that. that. Six like, year old. They were six years old. He couldn't yeah. have been waiting for Izzy. That's ridiculous. Yeah, no, I totally he agree. He was scared. He was scared to leave, and he used her as a subconscious or conscious excuse. Is yeah. the way I look you think at so? It. You think she was involved at all in that decision making think, process? I, I think she I think was he a used bit. it as a convenient answer. To maybe maybe to himself because he didn't. It didn't sound like he necessarily went around telling everybody, "Hey, I'm waiting for this girl to come back." You no. know, but but I think sometimes we fool ourselves. Sometimes we have to pull the wool over our own eyes to convince mm-hmm. ourselves that what we're doing is better for us when really what it is is it's more comfortable. And I think yeah. that's what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, hey, speaking as someone who is also from like backwoods nowhere, Michigan, like the reason that it took me a lot of years to move to Chicago was I I had to find an excuse every year of like. Oh no, it's just it's just one reason. Like I'm I'm working too much here. That's that's why I'm staying. Or oh, I have this friend, and you know, you'll find as many reasons as you need that aren't just acknowledging. Hey, I'm really comfortable, and I'm kind of yeah. scared of the unknown. And I think right. that Jules needed that extra push to go off into that unknown. And there's also possibly the element of when he was six and Izzy left every day for. A, a week, a month, a year. Like he went off saying, maybe it's today, maybe it's today, maybe it's today. And maybe that never quite, maybe he stopped checking, but it never quite left him, you know? So there's always that subconscious thing of, oh, right, I always did check if she was coming back. And then she does, and you're like, all right, I was right. But I do agree with you guys, though. I think ultimately he created a safe community of an easy job. No one's really rocking the boat, and he's very comfy. And comfort can be very dangerous, especially in Star Wars. Yes. Now, Charles, you mentioned a specific Athorian that a few people have met, probably listened to this podcast already, in Galaxy's Edge, who is yeah. Doc Ondar, the man himself who loves his antiquities, who loves his artifacts. He is pretty prevalent in this book. Yeah. We we really get our <clears throat> first look at Doc Ondar here, right? As far as the Galaxy's Edge line of books and comics have been going 
we get to learn a little bit about Doc. He has a lot of dialogue. He has some scenes. So a couple quick questions about him. Does the Doc list, as it said, um, which is basically if you screw over Doc, you're on the Doc list in Black Spire Outpost. You will not work for him, and you are basically known as a ne'er-do-well or whatever. Do you guys think that had weight the way it was written? Like, Did it feel like something that actually mattered being on his bad side? A, a, a little bit. I mean, I, I don't know. It was conflicting because he wasn't a gangster. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not like, oh, he's not Oga, that's true. Yeah, Oga is a gangster, and it makes sense, just makes perfect sense. You get on the gangster's bad side, you can't do business in town. But Doc is, like, who is he? Is he like a... Is he an underworld trader? Like, what's his gig? Like, I don't really totally understand it, and that makes it hard to answer that question a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. For, from my point of view, I think I, I saw him more as the, the black market dealer, right? Like, Oga deals with a lot of your normal gangster stuff. Like, you're going to go to her cantina. Maybe you need someone taken out. You need, like, some dirty work or whatever done. Whereas Doc is literally like, I can get you the stuff you need, and if you're on my list – you will not have access to any of this stuff and you yeah. won't have, and I will tell people not to trade with you. And I think doc is like old enough that he has some reverence that like mm-hmm. him and Oga definitely have a gentleman's agreement about. Yeah. He's you know, like we're the both... res- respected old time shop owner. Of yeah. Life. And yeah. Oga is like, I will shoot you in the marketplace. Did you guys watch, uh, Oh, uh, Luke cage on Netflix. Did you ever First watch season? Some... I did. Yeah. Okay, uh, Netflix is Luke Cage. Like, there's like the local barber that Luke works for. Mm-hmm. Like, he's uh, what's his name? I can't even remember. Oh, I forget. But that is a uh, great comparison. Yeah, so he's like a you know he's just a well respected community member. Like he's an old timer. Like a lot of people like refer to him with some kind of name like like Pa or mm-hmm. or like Pop Papa or Pops, something like yeah. Pops. Yeah, I think that might have been his name. Was that his I name? It, it might have been the barbershop was Pops, Pops. I think. Yeah, yeah, something like that, right? So like, it's just that person that nobody wants to mess with. So like, just because they're so well respected and wise and have been around mm-hmm. for everyone, I don't know. I think what you said about Doc versus Oga is very. Uh, it's probably the most overwhelming evidence that made me think that the Doc list is not a big deal. The other thing is that in this story. We're told that essentially all the people that work with him are leaving, and the only other person besides Jules that we see that works for him right now is like a nine-year-old kid. <laughs> or, I don't remember what was his name. I, I, I um, Pat wow. or it do- Tam. Or- it doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. But you know that was like there were people actively leaving, working for him. So like, do I care if I'm on your list that where I can't work for you? If I'm if there are people that are leaving anyways. You know what he kind of reminded me of in that, in that regard was Varys from game of Thrones who had all like the little kids that would like run the rumors for him. Right. Yeah. Cause Tap. he was like, his name is tap. It Thank was you. tap. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I felt like doc was, he knew every, he knew all the rumors. He knows all the information and he won't move any, he won't, you know, shake any boats. He's not going to do anything horrible, but if someone screws him over, they will be blacklisted throughout Batu. Because yeah. I feel like if Doc tells a shop, hey, this person's not welcome anymore, they're not welcome anymore. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. where his power comes from. Uh, now, one thing, as I was listening to your guys' interview with Delilah Dawson last week, episode 19 of The Living Force, well done, gentlemen. She mentioned that she was told in an, to steer away from Doc in Black Spire, which uh, look forward to our roundtable on that later this month. Do you guys think that – did you guys feel that – that was an obvious choice. So rather, there wasn't a lot of Oga in this book. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Was that she was mentioned that she could have Oga because Doc was in this book. Do yeah. you feel like you Oga was intentionally slighted in this book to make her free for Black Spire? Uh, I don't know that I would go as far to say that. I definitely like that they kind of took, they both took one of these people. Like, agreed, agreed. I love that. Uh, now, none of us have, you finished Black Spire, Eric, right? Yes. Charles, you have not. No, my uh, yeah. my non spoiler review is currently on utini dot com, and right. tomorrow mm. there will be a full spoiler review of Black Spire on utini dot com. Nice, nice. Yeah, so I haven't I haven't finished Black Spire yet, but it's definitely like the way that that Oga in 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 this book is sort of this mysterious, powerful character, and Doc is like not, and then in Black Spire, how it's the opposite is true. How Doc is this yeah. like mysterious character. I like that. Like I I kind of appreciate that they both play off of each other a little bit so mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Did, what, what was your question specifically? Can we tell that? Yeah. Did, did it feel like it was glaring that we didn't get enough Oga? And I think you answered it like, I no. I I think, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. And I think that ultimately this answer is a question I'm going to get to later where I, I was worried initially that this was going to be a very advertisey book for the park, right? This was very much going to be – this whole line could have been, hey, come to Disneyland – Sure, we'll give you a book, but we're really just trying to get you to spend money. Yeah, that's not but, true. No, it's like, not true at all. No, not think, at all. If there's nothing – we talked about that in the interview with Delilah, and there's nothing else mm-hmm. that you get out of these Galaxy's Edge books. Like, we had that conversation at Utini when that we mm-hmm. these books were first announced. We're like, okay, like, we want to be excited, but in a way it does kind of feel like a marketing ploy. Like, the books are called Galaxy's Edge, A Crash of Fate, Great Galaxy's Edge, Black Spire, and like – Eh, I mean, is this yeah. just a giant marketing ploy? It doesn't feel like that at all. It feels no. like legitimate world building. And I said that in the interview with with Delilah, like her first couple chapters where where her main character is walking through like the markets and stuff. It really mm-hmm. feels tactile, like in, in a way that like only makes sense if somebody has actually seen something. And right. I mean, it's beautiful. It makes me really want to go to to, to Galaxy's Edge. So it, exactly, it, it worked as a marketing ploy. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is like I to, to go back to your point about Doc and Oga. I think that they are both between this book and Black Spire, individually, given so much agency and so much interesting story that they actually built characters out of these things that are like you know Doc's an animatronic, <clears throat> but at the park, so we know that. But within these pages, he is a fully realized character. Yeah, especially in this one. So I think is, is is Oga a character at the park? I don't think Oga is a character at the park. I think she is. She Just is spoken Cantina. about, and you can, Judy, you can ask like cast members who work there about Oga. You can talk to all the workers, and they all have individual backstories about their dealings with Oga and Doc and stuff. I can't wait to do that. Like, I wonder. I'm I wonder so how excited. many. I wonder how many people have done that already. Like. Like have have a lot of super informed people gone to, like out of the percentage of people that are walking through Galaxy's Edge, how many of them have read all the comics, all the books? I mean, you, you oh, guys think I it's mean, a lot? For the percentage I mean, for the percentage, I'd say it's probably small, but there have definitely been people that say like they talk to uh, cast members, and I, I'm I'm blanking on exact specifics, but if you just look through Twitter stuff, like people have talked to some of these cast members about things that have happened. Like someone asked them about uh, Zoraida Cordova. And was like, oh, there's a historian that wrote a book about our world, and like they're wow. aware of the books, they're aware of. That's so and, um, amazing to me. And, and this, is, this, is, Do- this is such a new thing in Star Wars. Like we've never yeah. gotten like a place we can actually walk through and see yeah. and stuff. And people have like been going up to Vi Marathi, and if you say um, something about the Spark of the Resistance or something, then she will like take you back and like talk to you about specific things, and it's it, it's huge. So, I mean, guys. On one hand, yes, these books don't feel like a marketing ploy, but damn if they don't get you excited to go to Galaxy's Edge. <laughs> yeah, that's totally true. All right. So off of characters, uh, we're kind of flirting with the overarching questions, so let's just jump right in, shall we? Yes. This book focused mostly on the evolving relationship between Jules and Izzy, specifically between the two of them. We talked about how it's really big on young love, and it's very passionate. Did you guys find their love believable, ultimately? I know we talked about their individual, whether it be love, whether it be lust, whatever that is. Did you find their relationship believable and earnest? I did until about 30 minutes ago, in which you guys informed me that this book only took place over a 24-hour <laughs> period. So <laughs> now, now I'm, like, questioning everything. But, I mean, up until that point, I mean, I will say that I thought the scene where they were at that water place, like towards yeah, the end of the book, the like, yeah, I thought that felt very genuine. Like, yeah. it felt like a, a real sort of true love type of thing. It wasn't, it wasn't overly like erotic, but was also sort of, I mean, like, it was pretty sexy. Yeah. There was you enough, like, there was enough sort yeah. of like sexy element there to, for it to be like romantic, like yeah just just barely skirting the line of pg-13 i think so yeah it's a great point charles yeah i mean i i think it's believable um again really just because this is supposed to be like a depiction of young love but yeah i i do agree with you Corey. that who's to say that if this happened in 24 hours like i mean what happens in the next 24 right maybe they hate each other Mm -hmm. by the end of that day who knows which I think is very interesting, us as you know, guys in our late twenties now, essentially all of us, versus like the eighteen-year-olds yeah. in this novel. 
uh, that are getting shot at. You know, yeah. like maybe when you get a bullet goes through your head, you're like, maybe I'll love you forever. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> like, I, I guess, might die yeah. tomorrow. You know, we so also find... probably have a fairly biased perspective too. I mean, I'm married. Charles has been in a long term relationship for a while. You've had on yeah. off relationships, Eric. I mean, yeah, like, we're, we're we're all very stable romantically, so we can look at this exactly. And be like, okay. But I okay. thought it was fairly believable, not as believable as Lost Stars, if you want to throw that out there. I do, because that's our next question, boy. So we did mention this earlier. It's <laughs> it's inescapable comparing this to Lost Stars. because That, w- that wasn't on purpose, by the way. I, oh, know, I know. I, I know I can see the questions, <laughs> but like I didn't realize that the next question was about Lost Stars. <laughs> no, it was beautiful. Well done. So we, you did mention this earlier, and when this first got announced, people were talking about Lost Stars comparisons because – We've only really gotten these two for, like, canon romance-specific stories. Dark Disciple definitely has an element of it, um, but I think these are the two traditional romance stories, right? But that being said, do you guys think it's a fair comparison to put this in Lost Stars next to each other? Not, Not at this point talking about quality of writing or anything like that, but do you think you could pair these? Like, if we're doing a Utini list... Do you think yes. you'd put these together? Oh, yeah. If, if, if yeah. we have a – which I think – do we have a collection of We do have romance? a romance list. Yeah. Okay. We have a romance collection on utini.com, and both of these books definitely belong on that list. They're there, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it kind of compares. I mean, it's, cla- it's classic young love, like mm-hmm. sub-20-year-old young love, and I think it fits in that nicely, totally. Yeah. I think it'll definitely be compared. I think that – I mean, ultimately, I think Claudia Gray is – is the master of all masters, and I think that... Superstar. Yeah, and also Lost Stars is very galactic. I mean, it literally spans many years, many planets, things like that. So in the, in that respect, I don't find them comparable. Mm-hmm. But I will say, if you did love Lost Stars because you're a human with a pulse and blood flowing in your veins, um, <laughs> you can definitely get kind of shades of that love in this yeah. book. Because I, uh, if you're looking for that specific kind of passion that... Um, Sienna and Thane have for each other. We kind of haven't seen that level of it. No, until this. I book. mean, there's less cave sex in this book, and that's a negative for me. So, <laughs> but there's almost <laughs> cave sex. That's the thing. There's almost cave sex. <laughs> you know, okay, I, so, sorry. Go ahead, Charles. I well, I'm about to go on a, a little bit of a of a rant here because this bringing this Bring up compared it. to Lost Stars yep, is for me why this book did not land for me very well okay i think because i have read lost stars and know how this can be done in the star wars universe is why i didn't enjoy this so much Mm -hmm. and it really comes down to lost stars was the classic ya story just like we saw in a crash of fate but it was grounded heavily in the elements of star wars that we all know and love it found a way to tell that ya story but pull in so many things that are familiar this book, maybe after I've been to Galaxy's Edge and I have laid eyes on Doc Ondar and I've had a drink at Ogus Cantina, maybe then, maybe then it will feel yeah. like it was grounded in Star Wars. But for right now, it felt like it could have been a, a book set in anything. Like yeah. it, it didn't really have anything to do with anything in Star Wars that I'm familiar mm-hmm. with. So it could have been, this could have been a Star Trek young, young adult novel. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it could have been. Yeah, I there's mean, a blue-haired guy. I totally I mean, agree I with that. I mean, there, there definitely needed more first order resistance in here. Like, mm-hmm. like I, I'm getting into Black Spire now, into the places where like that's becoming more and more apparent. All the yeah. first order stuff. Like, yeah, we, we don't want to spoil anything about Black Spire, obviously, because but there are definitely. I mean, obviously, there's first order resistance stuff in Black Spire. I mean, Vi yes. is a first is a resistance spy. Okay, that's obviously yeah. first order resistance. So. That's not a spoiler. Calm down. But, <laughs> like, there definitely just was not enough First Order stuff. Like, I remember first hearing about it in Crash of Fate, like, when we were getting to some of the scenes where it was at a distance, and I was like, okay, this is happening, right? We're getting – she's about to join the Resistance or something crazy like that, and it never happened. It was just mm-hmm. very – you know, it felt like yeah. – Because she sm- did deliver small. the uh, – yeah, they, they delivered the package to the Resistance and met them and, like, did the whole thing. And that was left. it. Then they left. That was it. Like, yeah, but it, it was like, well, why even bring them into it? I know they didn't play a part in it at all. Yeah, it like if this was yeah. a two, maybe if this was a two part book, or like maybe just one larger, double the size of the novel, and make it a part one and part two, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I totally agree. The scope was too small. Was be how I would put it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Because so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a, a question again. A very natural segue. Mm-hmm. I wrote. It's one of the first books we've gotten in a while that's pretty separate from the greater galactic conflict, 
right? It is absolutely taking place in the time of Resistance First Order, but it doesn't have a lot to do with it, except for the epilogue, which I do want to dive into on this question, right? So, first of all, I want to ask you guys just a quick answer on this one. Do you want more books that are separate from the greater conflict? Because given that we are about to get Episode Nine, which is going to round out the Skywalker saga, is going to round out these giant conflicts, we assume, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like there is a potential going forward of more books that don't involve the Empire, don't involve the First yeah. Order, that are just people existing in this galaxy. Do we think we want more of those, or do we want more that are related to giant conflicts? I mean, I want to say yes, I do want more, because I do have fond memories of, like, books that are kind of related to the big picture, but kind of not. Like, for example, the Coruscant Knight series, I don't know if you guys have read any of those books, but, uh-huh. like, it's about a Jedi who, like, escaped Order 66 and stuff, and he's, like, a detective, I think, and, and mm-hmm. it's, like, I would I would love to see more books that literally have nothing to do with anything, but mm-hmm. that's, like, not the new style. Like, the new style is, like, everything has to be important and be approved mm-hmm. by 17 different people. Like, Delilah told us, like, I mean, I don't know. I, I want I want new stuff, but... Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a balance, it's like, like, with a... So, again, listeners, you can't see. Charles has Kenobi very prominently displayed on his bookshelf behind him, which is a book that, frankly, has nothing to do with anything. It yeah. has a character that we know, but... The conflict in that book has nothing to do with a greater conflict, but it is handled in a way. But it is a major character. Exactly. And I think maybe that's the balance. So maybe if this yeah, story I were think... to be told with, like, I mean, Solo, it's Han, it's Han, but it didn't have anything to do with the Empire until, yeah. obviously, the end. But even, like... I think there has there has to be something about a big conflict, though. It is called Star Wars, mm-hmm. after all. Totally. You know, like, and that's not to say that everything has to be empire and rebellion or resistance and first order but there has to be enough to connect it to the yeah. story or else or the films it's like my, maybe like as far to go say it has to be connected to the films and the tv shows at least okay. like sure but like even kenobi like even though it has nothing to do with you know like the empire like it is a gigantic gap of time in which we know that kenobi is in is in place but like and we know the empire is existing maybe a better way to put it and i mean he's communing with qui-gon and all these things that do connect it to the film yeah yeah yeah. Uh, maybe a better way to put it is i would like to see i would like to see more stuff that has nothing to do with resistance and first order that what that is like like totally disconnected from them like like even ahsoka which is Uh you know about a main character that's not a main character right Mm mm-hmm but yeah. even 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 that book ended up being very connected to the Rebels TV show, and <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't know I don't, I'm kind of just like what, my favorite stuff about the older expanded universe stuff is like there are gaps of time from the films and movies that you want covered, and they just fill in those gaps. That's that's my favorite yeah. part. But we don't really get a lot of that in in canon. Yeah. It's more like well, I mean. We're getting a we're getting two more Alphabet Squadron books that'll do that. So that's true. Maybe maybe so maybe stuff like that is that. This is this is good for what it is, but if they want to... You guys are saying if you want a more galactic appeal, basically. Like, have, yeah. some, have some kind of consequences for something beyond this single planet. Yeah, and it's I hard think to for, say. If you're gonna I don't know do, what I want. If you're going to do a small conflict like what we see in this book, then I need the book itself to be about the conflict, I think. Okay. And okay. and not to be oh by the way there's this background thing happening but this is a love story you know what I mean yeah. and that's maybe just a personal preference but sure I, there needs to be more direct conflict for me all right totally hear that now on that note I want to I want to bring this to a a slightly more serious question because Charles isn't running this so you knew what you get when you when you let me do this it's gonna get a little political for a hot second so this book talks a lot about the Batuans. Uh, and how they think about the First Order, right? Batuans. The, Batuans. <laughs> uh, the native Black Spirians. And how they relate to the First Order. And it is very much kind of like what Jyn Erso says in Rogue One. Right? Like, it's very easy to live if you don't look up. It's very easy to live as the First Order is coming in, but they don't really care. Right? It's, my, it's, it's a, my favorite quotes from Rogue One, by the way. Yeah. And it's kind of horrifying in, in, in what it implies, right? Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so great. And in this book and in Black Spire a little bit, uh, when you get to that point, uh, listeners, there's a big, there's a big part of those books that say the native people 
don't really care about the First Order because it's not affecting them directly. And it's and it's repeated over and over and over in both of these books. Do you guys think that was intentional by the writers? Do you think that that seems to be something that is making its way across a lot of different Star Wars projects? Do you think that's a comment on larger things in life? Like, how, how, did, that, how did that land with you about the idea that all these people in both these books are saying, well, this doesn't affect me, so I'm not going to look up, even though we know how evil the First Order really is. Yeah, I don't I don't know. It's kind of that... I, I don't know how to answer this. It's hard, like, man. It's hard. Because it's the same thing. And this, this same commentary is very prevalent in the Clone Wars TV show, right? Mm-hmm. There's like the, the separatist planets that... Like, they don't care about the Republic because what the heck has the Republic ever done for them? But... Yeah. At the same time, as soon as the Separatists show up and are trying to kill everybody, like, mm-hmm. oh, well, we need the help of the Republic. So, <laughs> Right. I, right. We I, didn't know until it was me. Well, what is your question exactly? Are you asking about, like, is this... Was it purposeful social commentary yeah. on our real life? Basically, cause, because because I think that ultimately, at, at the end of the day, for, for me, the way I read it, right? Yeah. From my personal background, from my life, is that this these books are really encouraging empathy a lot. They're, because they're yeah. showing that if people don't care about a greater conflict yeah. or a greater evil until right. it affects them personally, then they will be doomed, essentially. So it's kind of encouraging, especially a younger generation, I see what you're saying. to be more empathetic. Do you think that's – do you think it's as intentional as I do, basically? Yes. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe intentional because uh, – all right, let me put it this way. Intentional because that's what the author cares about. Sure. Not not intentional because Disney has got some sort of bullshit agenda. Great. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay, I so completely I, agree. I want to. I want to yeah. clarify Let's that. Say that, that. Like, we at Utini, I don't think we've never talked about this. I don't think ever. But I don't think any of us think that there's some sort of hidden agenda with Disney and the media. No. Like that seems stupid. They Disney cares about making money and that's it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll say let's that. Be, let's be frank. It's a company. They want to make good media. They care about Star Wars. They want to yeah. make money. Like. Yeah, but the it's, authors can then simultaneously do that and put in messages they believe are worthwhile. And yes, and media. I think I think that in and of itself is social commentary, like yeah, about agreed. our current state, because people that are writing are are, are probably a little more connected and they're mm-hmm. educated, and so yeah, I, I definitely get that. I mean, like it's easy. Like, you put it well. Like it's easy for us to look at like these backwoods people on Batu talking about the first order, like it's no big deal and it's beyond their scope. And we all know that that's not true. Like, yeah. we know that the first order is very capable of showing up and killing everybody. Like no big deal. So, yeah. So yeah, I, I just thought that was very interesting. And I think to put a little, it is a, it is a very, it is an interesting question. More. Yeah. So just something, to, just something to think about as you're reading. All right. Last couple things here. This book is called a crash of fate, right? And on page 74, I want to read a quick quote and then talk about the title just a smidge. On page 74, they say, But wasn't coincidence just a version of fate for those who didn't believe in anything? Which really struck me because nothing's accidental in Star Wars, right? Like, everything is kind of connected. The universe is literally based around a magical force that can connect things. So what I want to ask you guys is, do you believe the fate in A Crash of Fate... Is the force? Do you think it, it was it was the force that brought these two together? Do you think that fate means something else? What what do you feel about this this specific title and how it might relate to the greater mysticism of Star Wars? Uh, that's, that's a, heavy a question. big question. <laughs> yes. That's a big question. Your turn, guys. Um, this this is how authors feel when they come on the show and we ask them <laughs> what their like, legacy yeah, is. Exactly. I think my answer to this is our fate and the force the same thing no but the force one of its byproducts is people's fate if that makes sense Ooh, i love that okay because <laughs> and i'm gonna leave you i'm gonna leave you with the words of cheer it all is as the force wills it which speaks towards fate think about it that's one that's, oh, that's one of the same thing that's good man yeah, I mean, I, I I definitely agree with that. Like, what is the fate in Crash of Fate? It's super hard to answer. Like, mm-hmm. I don't I don't really know that 
there is and the the whole like does the force control everything is still a very philosophical question for me like absolutely yeah because like it's very similar to like the you know if you believe in a higher power which like you know we rarely talk about our own personal religious beliefs and stuff but i mean Mm -hmm. i do i believe in a higher power and it's like i frequently think about the question like how much what is free will right like and, and that's an important question in star wars it's like does does everybody actually have free will from the force? Like, like there's that you know the quote like everything is as the force wills it. I mean, is it though? Like, is there actually a balance? Like, what what power does the force have over everything? Is one of my favorite questions to think about in Star Wars because it's like the question. It's yeah, the whole because, premise of Luke's perspective in the Last Jedi. Yeah, because ultimately, idealistically, the Jedi should just be listening to the force and acting, whereas the Sith are actively trying to bend the Force to their will, right. to kind of erase yeah. that destiny, to but erase that who's to that say fate. if you can even do that? I mean... Who knows? It, it, you, you have asked one of the biggest questions in life, just with a Star Wars twist, yes. and it's I, it's so hard to answer. Here's my, here's my <laughs> question to fire back at you. What is the crash that they're referring to in a crash <laughs> of fate? Yeah. Oh, to me, I think it's it's them crashing back into each other's lives quite like mm. quite metaphorically it is them you're a poet eric yeah <laughs> thank you very much uh but yeah it's them crashing back into each other's lives it's it's all i mean a literal crash she needed her ship repaired to get off the planet but <laughs> uh, what, what do you think the title means the crash of fate a fate what is that i think for me it, it's it's double because i do think there is a literal meaning of her crashing on the planet brought her back to this part in her life she would never think about. So it's kind of faded. She would always come back here no matter what she thought she would ever do. It's like how you always try to run away from your hometown, but then it sometimes you just end up there. And that's actually where it's supposed to be the whole time. Mm-hmm. I also think there's a possibility of the metaphorical crash of the two of them being at this crossroads in both of their lives. Jules is, should I stay? Should I go? What am I going to do? Izzy is, do I join gangs and kind of follow my mother's footsteps or do I go back to where I came from and rediscover my roots and they crash into each other and kind of alter each other's you know tracks of fate as it were so yeah I think it's a cool title and something that I think a good title makes you think yeah so Thrawn Reason (laughs) Thrawn Brisk (laughs) (laughs) alright two more questions y'all first of all the quote gets repeated a lot. Everyone on Batu is either looking for a new life or running from an old one, which is a great line, I think. Yeah, that's a great, great line. I, I hope that is just like printed on a sign somewhere in Arabesh. In, it in... should. Oh my god, that'd be cool. Yeah, looking for a new life, running from an old one, which I think honestly can be attributed to any of us when you go to a new city, like when you guys went to med school, like you're looking for this new chapter in your life, like whereas I know some people that have gone to graduate schools that are just trying to escape from not being successful in their current lives. That's, like, that's a good point, yeah. You know? Um, do you guys think... and th- So in this book specifically, do you think that's true? And how does that apply to Izzy and Jules individually? Which which one are they? Uh, good question. Yeah, I don't know. Izzy hasn't figured it out yet. Like, I don't think I don't think she knows what she's doing, whether she's trying to escape something or find some new life. I mean, I don't think that Izzy would ever be satisfied becoming some backwoods farmer on... I agree to that. Yeah, I agree. I, I think they're I think they're gone. Personally, to to jump ahead, they're leaving Batu. Yeah, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> they I got a ship, so. which that kind of implied that at the end, anyways. Yeah, but I don't know. I think you hit it like right on the head. Whenever you kind of opened up with this question, I think it, they're kind of inherently related. Like if you are running from your old life, then you're looking for something new. And if you're looking for something new, then you're running from something. So, I, I mean, I think everyone is a little bit of both. Yeah, and I think that makes Batu and Black Spire specifically kind of a beautiful sanctuary for that. It says, you know what? We're going to be here. Come to us when you need us. Use us for whatever time you need. And then off you go. Like it, It's acknowledging that people are going to be transitory. And to be super meta about it, isn't that kind of like what Disneyland is sometimes? Like, you know what? (laughs) I'm freaking out. I just need to go here for a bit where everything is great. Yeah. And then I can go to the next part of my life. So that's definitely how I'm going to be using it whenever I go. Interesting. All right. And finally, this is a Charles question. The last one is Charles as well. This one is Charles. I want to give you props, man. Uh, You said, the entire crux of the story is finding acceptance, love, and ultimately family in a galaxy where you have every reason to feel alone 
How is that theme presented in this novel, and how does it relate to Star Wars as a whole? Two quotes on this. Page 223, they say, Do you think that we're supposed to understand our parents? I think we're supposed to at least to know who they are. Mm -hmm. And then 325, it says, You can choose which parts of your parents you keep. Which I think is kind of a heartbreakingly beautiful quote especially yeah. in in the time we're in now we're our our generation i think especially right a lot whatever your personal situation is with parents i think a lot of us as we get older realize if your parents are hero if your parents are enemy whatever it happens to be you can choose the part of them that's going to define you and you can take the good parts while acknowledging the bad or you can really let the bad keep you safe while acknowledging, no, there were some good times. And I think that Izzy and Jules kind of tackle this pretty hardcore, especially Izzy with her parents. Yeah. So with that being said, how do you feel about these two people that kind of had a messed up version of family and had a messed up version of acceptance kind of going through this book, finding their acceptance in one another? I mean, it's, it's what Star Wars is all about. I, I, I am answering kind of how I asked the question, and I understand that. But, I mean, life is messy. Relationships are messy, whether whoever it's with. But parental relationships especially. I mean, look at how messed up the Luke and Darth Vader like, <laughs> yeah. relationship is. There are very is. few people Spoiler in Star Wars alert. in general that have a normal parent relationship most people's parents are dead yes. yep or there are, I, was, like I was just thinking about that faction. when you were reading this question i was like, just like man there are a lot of orphans in star wars i've not really thought about that it's before. narratively <laughs> easy it gives you it gives you a big defining moment and you don't have to write the parents into it <laughs> yeah that's true yeah, yeah but but i think that like i mean the hero's journey just to go back to even just the new hope i mean it's it's all about leaving behind what is familiar and finding your place out amongst the stars in the greater galaxy. And maybe we're not hopping on to Millennium Falcons and flying off to other worlds, but we are venturing out into the world and we do have to find family. You guys are my found family, yeah. right? Like that that's what life is all about. And I think that that is what we see in this story um, and what we see really in, in every story from this book to Rebels to A New Hope with the yeah. big three. Mm-hmm. It's it's just a major major theme. Absolutely, totally agree. All right, man. Well, I I mean that's all the the main questions for this one. So I want to hit a couple of Easter eggs, and then I wanted to bring us back around and some final thoughts and some final ratings on this book. But first of all, some Easter eggs in this book. So this book's a little weird for Easter eggs because I thought about writing down some shop stall names in Galaxy's Edge, but that's not really Easter eggs when it's actually part of the whole marketing scheme, right? So there's a ton of things yeah. you can see in the park at Galaxy's Edge. There's drinks you can order, shops, creatures, etc. But there are a couple really cool specific things. Page 43, to start out, Jules talks to his speeder, just like Will Lark from Alphabet Squadron. So I like yeah. that personally because, you know, my boy Will, I would die for him. Of course you do. Uh, <laughs> on page 126, this is the biggest one for me, we meet Nate Gritonius, a character who Jules saves on the streets as Nate is getting beaten up, and he has a lot of weird collectibles with him. Do we think he's the Force Collector? Holy crap. Yes. I think he's the Force 100%. Collector. 100%. Do you guys really think so? Holy Cause, crap. Cause That's Force a Collector, big thing, man. Because at Comic-Con, they put up the, the Force Collector cover in the Galaxy's Edge line of books, and I'm like, he meets this random dude who gets a name... And he just happens to have a Nate? lot of cool trinkets with him. That Nate. kid, lo- he looks like a Nate on the cover. Nate Gratonius, I think like, it's the fourth selection. Straight up looks like a Nate. Like, if I had to pick a name for him, Nate would be in my top ten. Calling it right now, then. I think Damn, it's fourth Eric, collector. I'm impressed. <laughs> All right. A couple other things. Uh, page 259, Izzy mentions living on Gleon Somme for a bit, which we love. Homeworld of Kit Fisto and Tobias I, Beckett. Yeah. I love that. It's my favorite story, I think, in... Uh, in myths and legends, myths and, yeah, myths and fables is Gleon Psalm because that's just, that's a fun word to say, Gleon mm-hmm. Psalm, like the way it's spelled and to say it. I like that. So a fun. Lot. That's one of my favorite parts of uh, of Solo. Gonna go back to Gleon Psalm and learn to play the ballet chord. What a great, what a great movie. Makes Solo two happen. Yes. A couple others. Joe Yauza is said to perform at Oga's. He's the singer from the Max Rebo band in Return of the Jedi. Oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> Bring him back. Uh, Cookie, the chef at Oga's, was the chef at Maz Kanata's castle in Force Awakens. Yeah, I noticed that. Love it. 
a uh, couple more. Page 244, a screwdriver is mentioned, which is odd because they're usually hydro spanners, right? Are there screws in Star Wars? There aren't even buttons. Charles, you wrote this and it's bugged you. I mean, no, because the if you go and look at like costume design, behind the scenes stuff, they actively try to keep buttons out of Star Wars because it's yeah. too real world. But yep. they have screws. Yep. Yeah, that oh. has been a okay. major complaint amongst <laughs> people that are very familiar with Legends about some of the canon authors is they have used screwdrivers, sc- restrooms, things like that. Yeah, things like that. Mm-hmm. And and like to me, it's a little that's a little pedantic. I mean. <laughs> Yeah. It's it's arguing semantics and it's kind of yeah. stupid, but I th- I mean I, I get it I guess like should she should she have used hydro spanner instead of screwdriver I guess uh, yeah look at my neck beard yeah <laughs> <laughs> she used screwdriver she's not a real Star Wars fan I mean come on like okay, we'll what do, what we do, do we no know what it means saying, whoa 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 no one's saying she's not a real Star Wars <laughs> no fan. I know you guys aren't the but point, there are people the out is, there that are saying that and those people are stupid and wrong okay yep there may be but but I think it is it is true though that like listen when I'm reading a Star Wars book and I and I see the word bathroom it does throw me it's, like. Only because we're so trained to say things like refresher, in, but refresher and at the same time, Legends. you're telling me that in in thousands of pla- millions of planets and in, in trillions of beings, there's no such thing as a screwdriver. I mean, come on. Apparently not, not yet. <laughs> All right, two more. Page two ninety. Jules calls Damara Slimo, which was first hurled by Anakin in Phantom Menace. Love yeah. a good Slimo callback. Yep. And finally, page three twenty five. One of my favorites. Izzy strung up Jules family ring above the console of her ship, just like Han's dice. And she even says it's for luck. Just like yeah. Kira. Yeah. Wait, I have I have one more for you guys. <coughs> oh my God, hit because us, I Charles. forgot to put it in here, Eric. So this is I'm throwing this on Eric right Do now. It. Uh within I think that I have this theory mm-hmm. that Zorada Cordova was just sitting there watching Empire Strikes Back in the background while she was writing a part of this book because in like a four or five page span we get several names of drinks and like a band and different things, and it is uh, the Fuzzy Tauntaun, yes. the Frozen Wampas, the Bespin Fizz, and then the Carbon Freeze. Literally <laughs> within like four pages. That's and I was hilarious. just like, "What is going on?" Reference another one. Oh my god, dude! I need when I go to Galaxy's Edge, I want the four of those in a shot glass flight in front of me. <laughs> yeah. and I'll just take them all before our live show. It'll be yes, great. Let's go. The let's Empire go to Empire Strikes Blackout. Yes, <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> Let's go to Galaxy's Edge next year and just get wasted. That'll be successful. <laughs> oh, wow. What a hypothetical thing to say, Corey. And that's actually going to happen. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't. I can't flip and wait, guys. All right. So all that being said about A Crash of Fate, we talked a lot about the characters. We talked a lot about a lot of things that weren't necessarily involved in the plot. Because, again, like I keep saying on these shows, a lot of these canon novels are more character-based than plot-based. So I think that's where the heart of this book lies. I want to go around. Let's get our final possibly adjusted ratings of this book, if you wish. I'll start. I'm going to stick with my 8.5. Really enjoyed this book. I might go back to it. Uh, Let's do reverse. Charles? I will be brief because I think I've made all the points that I want to make. Mm -hmm. Um, But I will say if I was was rating this as just a young adult novel, 8. Mm-hmm. Since I am rating it as a Star Wars young adult novel, I'm sticking with my six. Okay. Corey? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I need to honestly probably do like a real breakdown of like my score to give you like an honest, honest, solid, objective answer. But I mean, I think seven, seven and a half is still pretty fair. Yeah. Like, I mean, to you have to look at, I have to look at the other books that are in my head, like in the ranges above and below. Like, so is it... You know, eights and nines are Tarkins and Lost Stars. Like, is it in the same category of those books? No, like I don't think so. But like, is it bad? Like, Heir to the Jedi bad? No. no. <laughs> right. So, you know, well, like, to- so I mean, seven, seven and a half, I think is pretty fair. Still, I mean, I, I always welcome more romance in Star Wars just because there's not a lot of it, and and that's like a right. super popular genre. And we have the Raylo community on Twitter is like super mm-hmm. big, and like. I don't know. That's a that's an important part of Star Wars. So bring on the romance and I'm happy to see that. So even if even if the stuff we get is like not like nine, ten out of ten quality, 
I'm bringing on. Like, I enjoyed reading this book. Like, I, I finished it in maybe three or four sittings, so I definitely mm-hmm. think I enjoyed it. Like, I yeah, it is a super fast read. It was a fast I, I read, and I, I enjoyed it. Like, I enjoyed the Galaxy's Edge sort of tie-ins. I enjoyed getting mm-hmm. to see the stuff like in my head that I'm gonna walk around in one day. And yeah, I, I liked it. I liked it okay. All right, and just to uh, let you guys know, on Utini.com. Our group consensus score is currently sitting at, and this will be the final, I assume, because it's been a bit, a 7.9 as far as everyone goes. Okay. So, I haven't rated it yet. <laughs> okay. I haven't either. <laughs> well, everyone else rated it with me, so we'll see what those two guys do. And hey, if you loved this book or didn't love this book, add your community rating to the official book profile of Galaxy's Edge, A Crash of Fate, and let us know what you thought. That's another one, guys. We did it. We did it. We did a one-show roundtable. We said we were going to. We did. I mean, given it is like fifty percent longer than any other episode we know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so I don't know if it's fair to say that we had one episode or like you know two really short half episodes. But... Yeah. Well, we'll see what this happens with Black Spire. I'm I'm gonna say right now we're probably gonna go back to our two episode format. I think uh, so. I mean, it's, Black it's a longer Spire's... novel. And it's important. And Delilah yeah. Dawson is quickly becoming kind of a superhero. So yeah. So. Get ready for that. We have another interview coming out um, soon with some with some cool mystery guests. We have some great more uh, episodes kind of in the pipeline. Man, it is a great time to be a Star Wars podcast. I'll it tell you such, what. It is such a great time to be a Star Wars podcast. And I, I got to say, guys, like I feel really blessed and thankful that we've had as much like success with getting people as we have. And like, mm-hmm. I mean, I know that Utini is a little more connected because we've been around for a little bit longer than the podcast has, but like getting folks like Delilah that are come on to the show and, and are willing to talk to us is, I mean, it makes me feel like really important and that's not true at all. <laughs> no, but I hear it. No, I hear you saying it's, it's a cool fun. Feeling. Yeah, yeah, it is really fun and it feels like we're getting somewhere and like, I just feel really thankful that we have like as many fans and as, as many people that are willing to help us and talk to us and stuff. And, Mm-hmm. It's been a, it's been a great twenty weeks, and I can't wait to see what 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 episode one hundred and twenty looks like. One hundred percent. And between now and then, we'll do our podcast from celebration. We'll do our episode nine reactions. We have so Jeez. much going on. And to all you listeners, thank you because without you, we wouldn't have made it twenty episodes. We wouldn't be making it the next one hundred. So thank you for listening. Thank you for tweeting out your support and like. Anytime we see something on Twitter, we always share it with each other in our Slack channel because we're like, this is so cool. We're so yeah. excited that people are talking yeah. about us and reviewing on the site. Um, and it really means a ton because, again, like Corey has said many times, he started Utini because we were pretty sure we're the only people reading Star Wars books. And, man, is that not true. Not at so, all. So thank you all for your support. And we hope you liked Crash of Fate. And please, again, let us know. But on that... My friends, that'll do it for another week's episode of The Living Force. If you are a new listener, don't forget to subscribe to this show, please, wherever you get your podcasts, and tune in every week to hear us at Utini talk about the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Please leave a review on iTunes, thank you to those who already have, to help people find us, and head over to utini.com for reviews, articles, and comprehensive book profiles on every single story in the Star Wars galaxy. If you're looking to buy some books and want to help support the show, look up your book on Utini. Click the Amazon link on the profile, and we'll get a few cents to help keep the lights on. If you'd like to help us out more directly, find us on patreon.com slash utini, where you can join our amazing patrons. Thank you to Dylan Sasser, Adam Dyson, Timothy Dunlap, Rural Farm Boy, and Adrian Carlson. If you want your thoughts on the show, email us at livingforcepod at utini.com, tweet at us at livingforcepod, or join our utini discord community by going to utini.com slash discord. You can find us personally on Twitter at Eric Eilerson, Corey's at DocStarWarsMD, Charles is at C. Hankel. A special thank you, as always, to Matt Davenport, our amazing editor, Freddie, our producer, and Wes, our community manager. Thanks to Corey and Charles for podcasting with me. And as always, may the force be with you. There is no hatred. There is joy. There is no division. There is union. There is no apathy. There is passion. There is no gatekeeping. There is community. This is the Utini Star Wars fan code. Embrace it. Live by it. And above all, trust in the living force. That's all for this week. 
Join our community and surround yourself with like-minded fans by visiting us online at utini.com. Until next time, may the force be with you.